Hello, everyone. Welcome to our next session, Building Modern at Microservices at Scale with DataGrid and Quarkus. My name is Roel Hotsmans. It's my pleasure to welcome you all and to introduce our speakers for today's session. And that's Shaf Said. Hey, thank you, Roel. So, so glad to be here. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about building modern microservices with scale at Red Hat DataGrid and Quarkus. Uh, I'm going to deep dive into some of these things. So welcome to the session. I hope you're excited and ready for uh, a quick presentation and a demonstration as well. Uh, before, so you quickly, kick off, before you kick yeah. off, I do want to remind people that you can ask the questions either via the chat window or via the QA window. Um, the recording will be made available after. And please, please also follow Shaf. He put his contact details here. Don't hesitate to reach out. We will try to answer all the questions live if they come up. If you have questions later, um, uh, we will try to answer them as well. So reach out via these channels. Um, and with that, take it away, Shaf. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Roel. Yep. So any questions uh, I'm not able to answer, definitely we'll get back to it. Feel free to just post them. I will take the questions uh, as, as quickly as possible. And Roel, you can, you can help me with some of those as well. Um, so yeah, so me, I'm a Java developer uh, from quite a long time, actually. Uh, maybe I shouldn't, shouldn't really say when, but if you've done Swing in AWT back in the days, then yeah, you'll find me in that zone as well. Uh, I'm a developer advocate uh, at Red Hat, you know, work with architecture, solution architecture, um, and also have been an engineer in the past. So I'm an open source enthusiast. Uh, I'm an InfoQ uh, editor as well for, for JavaQ. Uh, and then, of course, I'm a volunteer coach and trainer as well. So well, lots of things, but most interestingly, ask me anything about Java backends and architecture, and that's exactly what I'm going to talk about today. I have my contact details here in case you want to reach out as well. I'll definitely post the uh, speaker deck uh, later, so you can you can take this one as well. Uh, before I go in, um, you know what what am I going to cover? I'm going to talk a little bit about Quarkus, the uh, the ultimate Kubernetes native framework. Uh, I'm going to talk about DataGrid, which is a caching solution. Um, and if you have heard about the InfiniSpan upstream project, uh, we're going to go into a bit of details around that and how it works on Kubernetes, uh, like a distribution like OpenShift. Uh, you know, what features does it have? And, and then, of course, during this time, I will be showcasing demos throughout this, uh, throughout this talk as well. Um, and, and we're going to do a demo for cross-site replication, and hopefully everything will seem like how it's replicated through different data centers, and you'll be able to see your cache entries, et cetera. Uh, so hopefully, interesting, and, and uh, stay, in, stay in tune for this. Um, so what is Quarkus? Uh, Quarkus is a Kubernetes native framework. I say it's the ultimate framework. It's the next thing. It's, it's not a new thing. It's in version 3.0. But it is definitely one of the frameworks as a Java developer that you should look at. Um, it gives you the possibility to write microservices. It gives you the possibility to write serverless functions, whether you do that on AWS Lambda, Azure Functions, or if you're writing functions on, on Knative as well. Uh, if you're doing microservices and, um, and working with databases like Mongo, Postgres, uh, others, or you're doing streaming, event-driven design, all of that, you know, you, Quark is, is, has a lot to offer when it comes to that, whether it's rules, whether it's integration, et cetera. But most of all, Quarkus is also very fast. When it comes to uh, booting up quickly, it's able to do that in relatively a very, very quick time. As you can see on the screen on the right here, uh, it, it has the possibility to, um, to be compiled into native uh, using Graal VM. Um, and of course, it also has the possibility to be uh, used with JVM mode, which a lot don't talk about, is is also uh, optimized uh, much more than the traditional stack that you that you would see. The figures here I'm posting are are you know test figures from a simple REST API endpoint. Uh, when we talk about memory, it also takes a lot lesser memory, as you see at the bottom of the screen. A traditional app would take a lot more memory, but uh, with Quarkus, um, with JVM mode, uh, you know almost half of that, and then even native even further. I don't want to go into a lot more detail because there's a lot of other talks that are covering this uh, today. Uh, I think Kevin uh, showed something around Quarkus. Uh, my colleague Eric Dandria is also going to talk about that uh, later today. So, so if you want to learn more about Quarkus, those are the talks to to get into. What I love Quarkus the most um, is its its way how we develop applications. So it's 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 uh, it's simple. Uh, it it kind of 
goes into my workflow. I don't have to restart things. I can have test containers integrated really nicely. I have uh, continuous uh, <clears throat> testing, so I can test my uh, application while it's actually running in my in, on my machine, um, and I don't have to restart it over and over again. It has a nice CLI, et cetera, et cetera. But before I go forward, let's just do that. Let's just quickly take a look at you know uh, what a simple Quarkus application would do. So here I have my uh, my console, and I hope you can see my console. If not, then roll. You will just please tell me. Um, so I'll, I'm just going to, I'm using Quarkus uh, CLI. So let's just say I'm using version uh, 3.1, dot one final. So if you're using SDK man or something similar, you can, or you want to download Quarkus CLI directly from Quarkus.io, uh, you can do that too. What I will do now is, uh, of course, I will create an app. I already have a demo one app because I tried this before. Um, and by doing that, I'm, I'm giving that uh, parameters to a Quarkus saying create an app and it's called demo-2 uh, and it should have a pa package called, let's say demo-2. So here we go. It's going to create a simple Maven project for me. Uh, if I go into my uh, app here, uh, it's it's a simple Maven pod project. It has source, etc. So let's take a look at that. Um, <clears throat> Yes, I'm going to make this bigger so you can see it as well. And it has generated a project for me, which is a simple greeting resource project. Um, it has app properties, which are currently, uh, uh, there's nothing there. And then, of course, it creates some tests as well, right? Um, if I try to, and let's let's talk about developer friendly or developer joy here. If I, if I just do a simple um, work as dev um, over here, it's going to spin up uh, my local uh, Quarkus application, which is this one running. And I see that it, it gets a little slow probably because I'm streaming out right now. But let's let's see that it that it goes fine. Um, it's going to spin up the project over here. Uh, you can see that the application has uh, started on localhost 8080. Uh, but also at the same time, you see that it has options like, hey, uh, there is tests. Uh, do you want to run tests? So if I press R. Uh, it's gonna it's gonna run my test and it says that everything is running and it's successful, right? So it's awesome. It's it's actually the app is running. If I go back to my um, to my console here, uh, to my browser, here's my app which is running. I have a hello at endpoint which is let's say hello from REST REST Easy React. Simple app, nothing nothing specific at this point. If I go back in my resource and then just change this greeting message, hello from Dev Nation or hello Dev Nation. And here you see that my tests already start failing. And this is this is what continuous testing is doing. It's continuously testing. I could stop it or pause it if I wanted to. But then it is failing because if I go and look in my test, the specific test, it is not doing that, right? So it, it has a different um, different message that it's testing again. So let's just take that message uh, and make sure that it actually is the right message. Paste it over. And now you'll see that, that it starts passing. And if I go back to my um, app here and do hello, then you see that it's, it's simply changed and I don't need to restart my application or anything at all. Another thing that I could do now is while this is running, I could go in and add an extension. So here I'm going to um, add an open shift extension. And an open shift extension, what it would do is that it's simply Half, and, and could yeah. you do me a small favor? It's very, yes. very small. So could you boost it a little bit? Or maybe uh, choose the white background. Maybe that helps. But uh, the audience sorry, having some sorry, difficulty sorry. To, to read with you. Okay, hang on a second. We are going to do that. This is just a this is a much smaller demo, so we're not going to take too much time on this. But yeah, so in the back end, what's happened is that Quarkus has added um, the the extension into my uh, into my POM file, which is the OpenShift extension. If I see here, so now I have now I have a, I can actually deploy to my Kubernetes cluster, which is OpenShift. Uh, once this extension is added. At this point, I haven't restarted the app. I have done nothing. 
uh, nothing of those sorts to do it. So uh, what I'm going to do now is simply go and deploy this application to OpenShift. I could have done this from my uh, from my command line as well, but just to show you, we're going to do that later. Um, all the extensions that I have, this is the developer UI, which has all the details. I'm sure some of the other talks are going to go in more detail. But here I can say, okay, deploy my application to uh, to OpenShift. Uh, ex, you know, accept untrusted certificate you, because my OpenShift environment has an untrusted certificate. Can you boost this as well a little bit because it's rather small still? Just a yeah. simple zoom in. What's going on? Hang on, it's not zooming in. <laughs> Demos are awesome. Hang on, why isn't it zooming in? Okay, there you go. Ah, uh, that's much better. Thank you. Sorry about that. I somehow my computer keys are uh, saying, "Hey, don't do this anymore." <laughs> so I don't no know worries. why. No worries. Um, At least the audience now can see. Thank you. Perfect. So here, of course, my application is being deployed on OpenShift. So where is my OpenShift cluster? Again, I probably need to zoom this in as well. Yes, please. Uh, sorry. There you go. So if I go into my uh, project, developer console, if this is my current project, yeah, demo two. Um, and here my demo two app that was that was uh, that we were using is now deployed uh, onto OpenShift while we were fixing our zoom here. Uh, simple dev nation, of course, zoom in again, hang on. There you go. See, that's that's deployed. So, so in simple terms, it's a simple framework that is Kubernetes native. It helps you to do that. And this is pretty much how much I'm going to show about that today, uh, since this is not a talk about uh, Quarkus. So, so bear with me. So, so good stuff. You know, it's a it's a great framework, and we're going to see a little bit more how it works with Cache because if I if I provision or add a Postgres extension, it's going to do a test container at the back end as well. But I'll show some of that later. So what is Red Hat Data Grid? Red Hat Data Grid is an in-memory data grid that stores key values, right? Um, it, it supports multiple uh, data types. It has a lifespan of your cache. So imagine that usually you would write the cache inside, um, inside a map in your application. And once you do that, it's within your application. It's in the same memory. As a microservice, when you start to scale that or you have multiple microservices, all of the instances would start to store that map locally because they're all running in different JVMs. What Data Grid does is that it gives you that possibility to have that uh, key values uh, on a distributed uh, node, which is the Data Grid itself, which keeps takes care of how it scales, which takes care of you know, how the changes are mapped, what kind of events you need out of it. As soon as, of course, it gets distributed, you need to start to think about those things. But your application no longer needs to keep that in your memory. Obviously, there's going to be some use cases where you want to keep some of that hot cache inside there. You can use the near cache as well, or you can just use an embedded cache as well. So there's, there's tons of those features that uh, the data grid has uh, for you to store your um, application's data into the memory and scale with it as well. There are other features like transactions. You know, A lot of caches don't support that, but data grid supports transactions. It supports queuing as well, and it supports searching, et cetera, and cross-site replication, which we will see uh, later today as well. The, from the infra perspective, uh, you know, Data Grid is also pretty cool when it comes to how it scales out. On a Kubernetes uh, environment, you have the Data Grid operator. Uh, the operator manages all the different aspects, for example, encryption. Um, just by providing some of the CR into, into, the, into the Data Grid, it's going to create that encryption for you with SSL, TLS, whatever you want. If you don't want it, that's up to you. If you want to expose it as a route, as an ingress, as uh, maybe using a load balancer, all of those things are uh, provided to you through the infrastructure as well uh, that you can do. And it inherently scales out. So it, it has this hashing algorithm where it can understand how it's supposed to scale out as well. So multiple features on the infra ops as well. Applications that you would usually use this for is IoT applications. You could use it for, uh, you know, more mobile applications. So anywhere where you see the need to store your data temporarily or even long term, where you will be able to gain performance by doing it, uh, read performance as well as writes, uh, you would use um, Data Grid as well uh, to do that. 
Like I said, it's a key value store. Uh, the simple functions are put and get, and that's just that's just how you would interact uh, with uh, with the Red Hat data grid. Uh, when it comes to data types, it has scalar types, so you can use text, numeric, binary, any form. You can upload files into it if you wanted to. Uh, documents such as XML and JSON, you can put them in as well. Um, you, you the default is protobuf, so you use protobuf to to work with uh, data grid. And of course, there's use cases where you might want to have session detail, etc. Like in our example, when we have a cart, uh, we're sort of using a sort of a session emulation there, where we store that card into into our um, into our data grid as well. And then finally, collections, the Java collections, you can use them as well and use the keys over that as well. So you have a breadth of different objects um, that that you can work with at the same time. Another interesting thing that Red Hat Data Grid could do for you is, <clears throat> excuse me, um, it's going to be able to uh, give you events. So anytime uh, there's an update or, <clears throat> or deletion or expiration um, or insertion, any of those events, Red Hat Data Grid is able to listen, the server is able to listen, and it's able to pass that on to your, uh, to your application as well. Uh, it helps you to, to do that in terms, for example, you had petabytes of data in your cache and, and you wanted something happen within the cache, a new entry came, and you want to run a distributed server task that's going to run on the entire data set as well. So you could do that too. So you can have a process to do real-time aggregation and analysis, as well as you can do change to capture uh, use cases together with Divisium, uh, being able to queue some of this data um, uh, as, well, as, as soon as the events come in. You have the possibility to do queuing. So basically, uh, once your data is in there, you create a query, whether it's a simple query or equal query, and you're able to listen to that query as soon as that query changes, uh, you will get notification of those events. Uh, you are able to index the, uh, the cache, and you can provide them through the protobuf schema as well, um, which helps you to basically do searching and use uh, Lucene or Hibernate search sort of uh, mechanisms to do that as well. And it, of course, provides you statistics when that happens too. Um, security is one of the, you know, the, the most critical features, I would say. It has the possibility for you to have SSL TLS encryption, whether you're doing it through the client, whether you're doing it between the servers, whether you do it between cross data center regions, and it has the possibility to give you role-based access control as well. So you have multiple users who have you know, the different roles that they can be uh, using on top of the cache as well. Um, <clears throat> there's other options as well where, uh, let's say you can reload the, uh, or load the entire data set from, uh, from the underlying uh, database. There's, a, there's a file stores, there's data stores, and then there's SQL cache stores. So originally, uh, typically you would write an application that's gonna aggregate all the information from a SQL query um, onto the database and then put it into cache. Uh, data Grid has a feature where you can actually provide the query in Data Grid config in the cache, and it's going to pull that up and, and store it into the cache as well. And you can define the expiration, lifetime, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's some interesting stuff, but also if the data set goes down, it is still able to operate and your applications don't go down as well. From a resilience perspective, uh, that's also quite, quite good. <clears throat> it also is, has the possibility um, for you to uh, give lifespan to your cache, expiration, passivation, all those different features you are able to do with the cache as well. Um, on the redundancy side, which I'm going to quickly demo um, uh, as well in, 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 in a bit, uh, where you can basically replicate from one server to another or one cluster to another as well. So the ability not to just being able to do that within one server as a sparse, uh, or scattered cache, uh, but also being able to replicate that across different sites um, with the same cache as well. So you can define the cache and the schemas that you want to use there. So I mentioned scattered. In this case, when a cache is created based on, uh, let's say, the the, uh, the hashing algorithm that, that Data Grid uses, you are able to distribute your data across multiple, uh, multiple uh, nodes within the cluster. Orange, yellow, blue, and green over here are different data sets that are basically being scattered all over um, all over the different nodes. If one node goes down, it's going to rebalance, redistribute. Of course, redistribution has a cost for those who know caching or have worked um, on it in production. But again, it has the possibility to do that, and and it can you can either replicate it to all the 
all the nodes, or you can choose to have a scattered scattered redistribution as well. It's up to you. You also have the possibility to uh, keep uh, data in the heap within, which is traditionally being done, but then you can also have off heap um, data as well uh, within the cache, which, get, which gives you the possibility uh, to have the metadata, data management, all of those things that you don't really need within the same heap to optimize performance, you're able to do that as well. But then, like I said, you also have the possibility to store it outside in a database or use a file store, which is on a disk as well. So depending on the different use cases, uh, you could go with uh, with any of those options. So let's get into the into the demo scenario that I have prepared for today. Um, I have an inventory service, an invent and this is a store and e store. Um, so the inventory service has a simple POJO, which is basically uh, I'm using Quarkus and I'm using the Panache framework, um, and I'm using a, over here the repository pattern. But I'm just basically showing you uh, the model here. In the model, I have a simple item ID, I have a location, quantity. Um, and, and a link um, to that particular inventory item as well. Um, so that's that's how my inventory basic model looks like. Of course, there's a lot more code in there, uh, but but basically that's how the basic model is. Uh, the catalog is, is, is a catalog of all the products. It takes the data from inventory, it calls the inventory, and it also has the item ID, title, description, quantity. All of this information somehow needs to correlate because on the e-store, you have to have a catalog and an inventory as well. So catalog is taking care of the actual data about the product as well. Um, and then I have a cart, which is basically having the total of the cart items. It has the shipping, shipping cost, et cetera. It has some promotions and et cetera, all of these part of the model, and then of those different cart items. So basically when we sh shop on the, on the store, we are able to get, get all the cumulative data. And every time we're doing something that is going into the cart as well. Um, <clears throat> over here, this is the total overview. Um, I have the Angular app that is that is being written that basically calls these services to get the data or put the data into them, um, and and it caches that caches that data over there as well. So let's just um, let's just go back and I'm gonna switch here and try to see if I can have a bigger uh, bigger view. Um, I have multiple services, uh, the cart service, uh, catalog service, inventory service, et cetera. At the moment, I want to work on the cart service, so I'm just going to open that one. Um, and in my cats, cart service, I have something called the cart service implementation. It has a simple thing. Um, it has a, a cart cache variable, which basically is saying, okay, I want to I wanna be able to use this uh, carts.local but hey, do I have carts.local? That's a different question. We're going to take a look at that. And then, of course, it is creating that remote cache on the cluster. In the resources in my application properties, I have set up that, hey, I'm going to speak to this server. Um, and, and, and this server basically has is, is my caching server. So the host that it's there, um, my, my user, so the, I mentioned security and RBAC, and then the password as well. So let's quickly go back and uh, check our um, check the OpenShift console um, here. I have my NYC, and I've of course already deployed some of the components like my eStore, uh, which is uh, which is here at the moment. <clears throat> so I have my eStore deployed, uh, which is which is a simple store. I'm not a I'm not a front end person, so you have to just stick with my skills here. Um, and then, of course, I have the catalog service, which speaks to a catalog database, inventory service with inventory database. Um, and then I have the cart service. Um, and this one we can uh, we can just for now, okay, get rid of this. Let's say delete deployment config. This was our test app. So my data grid is installed uh, over here. Uh, if I if I go in and uh, look at my administrator view. Uh, it's just deployed to my operators. In my operators, I have multiple instances. And of course, this site that I'm working on is called NYC. NYC has two replicas. Uh, it has multiple resources. Here you would see that it's uh, created you the certificate. Zoom, those. zoom more. Can't see those. <laughs> yes, wow. please. Okay, hang on, dude. Learning as that helps. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so here you go. and. With you know, there's a generated secret. There's a security. There's all those different things. Um, there's the routes uh, that we're using. So in this case, I have an external route that I could use. Um, 
and let's see if I can use that one. So here my cache is, and this is my cache console. I'm already logged in, so it sort of like goes there already. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a cache, which is called parts. You'd have to zoom in that one as well. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I wasn't loud enough. Thank okay. you. There you go. Cards local. Uh, it's distributed. It's It has a proto stream, et cetera. No capabilities. I could use multiple capabilities, but, you know, we're just going to show you a simple card here. Uh, does it have leaping um, uh, concurrency level? Uh, yeah, sure, we, we could use that heap. And then, of course, next. Uh, and here I have my <coughs> cards.local. Now I have my cards.local. What I'm going to do is that <coughs> since I have that configuration here and and the password is hopefully the same as last time, um, I'm going to use my OpenShift extension. Last time, remember, I deployed it through the browser. But this time, I'm going to deploy it through my command line. So I'm just basically saying, hey, the Quarkus Maven plugin, uh, deploy this onto my environment. And it's going to basically just deploy. It's going to build this. It's going to create my jar file. And it's going to deploy this directly into my, uh, into my uh, namespace uh, on Kubernetes. And now it starts with Sorry, OpenShift. Sorry, did sound like a broken record? But this could also do a small bump up. Inside. Okay, I'm moving from this screen. Hang on. Um, <laughs> okay, so if I go back to my uh, developer uh, view here, and that's the thing. Okay, if I see my carts, uh, you can see that there's a build happening, build number 23. Uh, it's being deployed um, at the moment from my console. So push is successful. Seems like it's already deployed, which is great. Um, and then it's going to turn, uh, change my uh, pod that's running. I have the new cart. So if I go back here um, and start to um, do this, it's going to go. And here you can see that I have received a response from my cart um, as well. well. I am. If you increase the size. Yes, yes I just realized <laughs> that again. And, and my sorry, this, this is uh, my mistake. Um, and it doesn't do that. But anyways, that's that's the de that's the developer side. But we can go into uh, into the container. If you go into the cache container in cards local, I'm gonna see that yes, my card is here. If I go back to my to my uh, store and I start adding, I will see that you know quickly that it has <clears throat> it's it's gonna have the data uh, as well because it's been called there too. So this is awesome. I mean, it's rebalancing. It has a very basic con config. It's just a simple cache that's living on one server. It has a matrix as well. But what I haven't showed you, and, and in respect of time, of course, I'm not going to create a whole cross-site as well again. But here you can see that I have a cluster membership. I have two, two nodes in a cluster, two replicas. But then if I go back here, I also have another site, which is called the London site. And in the London site, well, OK. In the London side, if we, if I go there again, open console, uh, I have carts as well, and you can see that some of the data is already there. That's because I've sort of like tested this before. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to change my cache to um, to carts instead, which is a replicated cache, which will basically take all the data that we have on the NYC side, and basically uh, also replicate it to the London side. So in case of we want to we have a failback scenario or, or anything else, we would be able to do that too. So simple, at this point, I've done nothing about fallbacks and failovers. I have just simply uh, changed my uh, name of the cache. So I'm gonna deploy this again, and I'm gonna move back quickly because I don't want you to have the small view of the debugger there. Um, I'm gonna go back to NYC here. <clears throat> And on NYC, we will see that uh, our build is running, it's pending, and it's going to come up. Uh, and as soon as it comes up, uh, we will have a different cache, and that cache is going to be going to be starting to um, to replicate. If I go in, I can see um, the logs again. That yes, it's being pushed, it's being built at the moment, it's creating the container, it's pushing my jar file, it's pushing the image into the registry. Awesome. Uh, it looks great. Uh, if I go back to my cart here, the new pod is already in place. Awesome. So now when I go back and I hit this, 
uh, I'm going to get a new um, new card. And let's just say I'm going to add some stuff to it to see that it's actually it's actually working like we said. So this is our London site. Uh, and this is our primary site, which is our New York site. If I look in the New York site, all those items have come into the cache. If I go into my um, uh, London site, I will see the same items are also have come into the site. So when that's awesome. Zoom in, I mean, absolutely. Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, zoomed in. Yes, perfect. So thank you. So here you can see that that it all that, that it has that as well. So now just to just to make things a bit middle, little bit more fun, um, and bear with me here. I'm going to basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to try a fallback because what you want to do is that, sure, you have a New York site, but you also want a London site. And what you want to do is that um, if if the New York site was failing, you are also able to uh, fall back and, and maybe write the data to um, uh, to the London site, because that's exactly uh, what you might need in in um, in, a, in a production environment. So we're going to do that again. I, I changed some code and I went blazing fast, but basically I'm using the small ry um, a failover extension, um, and I'm using the fallback methods, basically saying that hey, do this randomly fallback every time you call the cart, and once you do that, there's a fallback service that I have defined, which is the cart's backup service as well. So it's going to do that too. So I'm going to deploy this, and hopefully this will work. Um, and it's deploying. And the same message that we see um, uh, when it's being pushed on OpenShift, we basically see the same, same log console here that it's built on OpenJDK 17. It's a particular image stream, which, are, which we're using on OpenShift. OpenShift has this concept of image streams where you can define a certain image stream with the container, and you can pass on your binary into it. So it's going to create that container um, from the source that we are pushing in, and then of course um, push it into the um, into the image registry as well. So now, if I go back here to my um, to my OpenShift console, and um, my app is 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 running. I think this is the new one, right? Forty four. Yes, um, it's up. We um, okay. What did we? Yes, perfect. So it was 45, not 44. Almost scared me. But now when I go back to my home and uh, and start to add stuff, um, I'm just going to make a couple of calls. Uh, and if I go back here, I see that uh, I have done something wrong. Hang on. I have. OK. So it's supposed to fall back, and it's going to fall back nicely but of course i've done something wrong we have two minutes left and let me just quickly see here da, 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 da. and i think it's also a good time to take questions because uh, we are almost out of time well at the moment uh, the audience has, has not just asked, asked the question so you can use some of your time to um, to uh, take some more time to explain stuff so all good yes okay awesome so what i'll do is so what we've what we've seen so far of course ah, is that wait. There's one question coming in. <laughs> Thank you, Naveen. Uh, he asked, uh, or she, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not completely aware. Is the cache two-way replicated when NYC uh, is back online and we move back from London to NYC, will we get the data back in New York as well? Yes, you, you can definitely do that. Uh, you will have the possibility to define that. You can have an active active cache, which is going both ways, or you can also go back let's say in your in your configuration and you have the possibility in case you had you wanted to do it manually you can do the uh, uh, start tra transferring it as well you can also take it offline um, to do that if you wanted to so yes there's a possibility to do that you have the opportunity to uh, define the topology that you want to use um, and and the, and the rules that you want to use for it as well yes cheers awesome so so what what we've done so far, we use an active-active setup. We we're able to cache that card into it. But I, I strongly recommend that you go ahead and look at the Red Hat Data Grid in more detail. This was a teaser, of course. It has a lot of different features when it comes to monitoring, observability, and the operator experience as well, uh, where we're able to use that natively onto on top of Kubernetes. Uh, but I also understand that a lot of you might actually be using. Um, a, a Redis uh, caching solution as well. And in that case, 
uh, the data grid also have a tech preview at this moment where you can use the REST3 protocol. If you This means that if you have a Redis client, uh, you would be able to connect to the data grid without even knowing that's actually a data grid behind you uh, working. So from the operational experience, you will still have data grid. From the client experience, you'd be able to use Redis. So in case you want to move, uh, you don't need to worry too much about um, the basic uh, Redis protocol there as well uh, in terms of, of course, not the administrative ones, but general data sets, et cetera, all of that should work. Um, and then again, of course, thank you for listening. Um, I have my details here and, and happy to engage and take your questions if there are any at this point. So Kihoro asked, um, uh, so um, they joined a little bit late. How does Quarkus help to, to deploy to a cluster uh, from a cache cluster? I think it doesn't really matter that it's Quarkus, right? Uh, you can do it from any application. Well, Quarkus is, yeah, you could do it from Quarkus, but Quarkus definitely helps you because uh, with, with Quarkus, if you look at my uh, model here, I have different options. Well, this is commented here, but I can write the cache directly into my system. Um, I have created the cache before, but then let's say my um, cache schema, my proto schema is, is also created just by the annotations here, which means that if I go back um, into, my, into my carts, uh, into my data container here, I see the schema that was created. This was created by the Quarkus app when I loaded my Quarkus app as well. Um, when it comes to simple things, like um, if I said over here, MVN Quarkus colon dev, um, what this is going to do, uh, hopefully, uh, we'll probably throw some exceptions because I'm connected to the, uh, to, to the other props. But basically, what this will do is that it will, from dev services, um, also going to spin up uh, a local data grid cluster as well. So if I if I went here in my uh, dev UI, um, I would be able to see that I also have possibility uh, to directly uh, work with my um, with my uh, OpenShift cluster as well. So here's my InfiniSpan con console, which is basically you have to zoom by... that in again. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. It's coming. Hang on. So. Uh... Kihoro asked a follow-on question. So if I have an on-premise OpenShift, can I join the service too? Absolutely. Yeah, with the right subscription for Red Hat runtimes, you can deploy the operator on your on-premise OpenShift, and then you go from there. Yeah, I'm running this on-prem. This is my own instance of uh, OpenShift running. So pretty much if you hit this URL, you'd be able to hit it right now. Um, and yes, you, you can easily install the operators. Uh, you just have to go through the operator hub, uh, search for data grid, and you would have it there. And then you have the possibility to uh, install it uh, on your cluster as well. So yeah, Perfect. Your problem. we'll have to wrap up. Uh, there's one final question that I will answer in the outro. Uh, so first of all, thank you, Shaf. It was a great presentation. Too bad we had to struggle a little bit with the fonts. I'll uh, right. I'll requisition a smaller monitor for you, <laughs> so uh, so we can uh, avoid this in the future. Um, as I said in the in the intro, but it's also still true in the outro. Um, everything we've done here today will be uploaded in the Red Hat uh, Developer YouTube channel, so you can watch these and later. Um, and Shaf will share the presentation slides and um, you can find his contact details as well. Is there any follow-up questions? Please don't hesitate to either go to the generic global chat or reach out directly to Shaf himself. Um, he's already busy in chat, so maybe Shaf, you can uh, share your Twitter so that people can easily find you. Um, yeah. Next up is the break. So we'll enter the break. So um, and hopefully you'll have the time for a snack and build some, some of that energy. Please stay away from the computer for a couple of seconds. And then um, we'll start the keynote. Uh, Burr Sutter is going to take us until um, in, into his session, becoming the developer's developer. Um, plus, if um, I don't know if there are as many spots available, but Chaf is also running a lab later today, uh, if that's possible. Uh, try to see if you can join there. If not, um, there's four other uh, contents, um, tracks happening right after the keynote. So don't go anywhere. Hope you had a wonderful time and um, good luck with the rest of the conference. <laughs>